My topic is on being teachable. In the Book of Mormon, Moroni, chapter 6, 15, or 6, 5, we can read, And the church did meet together oft, to fast, to pray, and to speak one with another concerning the welfare of their souls. This also seems like an important time to meet together oft, to fast, to pray, and to speak one with another concerning the welfare of our souls. Some of us may experience too many meetings. We are, are we not meeting and talking together all the time? Well, that's true, but there is in this scripture and others a particular spirit of meeting, a mutual caretaking, a spiritual reciprocity, and even as the Apostle Paul entreated us, a kindness, a desire to be tender-hearted toward one another. In preparing for today, I felt I should focus on what readies us to learn of the welfare of other souls? What readies us to be taught? And why, when we as a people are engaged in teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, should we also be engaged and concerned with being teachable? Several years ago, a theme of the General Relief Society meeting was learn, then teach. However, we sometimes only think about learning when we are in a classroom. We associate being teachable with being in attendance. In a campus setting, we can further link learning to required curriculum, specific prerequisites, sequenced electives, and really defined areas of study. We even develop beliefs about who can and should be teaching us. So when, as students, we finally get the classes we registered for, it's fairly easy to adopt the attitude, here I am, the rest is up to you. As a teacher, I share with any of you who face the classroom the challenge of looking at faces and watching body posture, listening to questions, and trying to determine each individual's readiness to learn. I accept there's a responsibility and a requirement to be ready to teach. But today, I want to focus on that powerful part of our interaction, which we influence as learners. What are we really like as learners? Over the years, I've seen and had students describe to me, usually after grades were in, <laughs> their role as learners in the classroom. Some would take the posture, go ahead, get my attention if you can. Some would say, I already know about this subject. Or some would say, I don't want to know about this subject. <laughs> some would say, I need to know exactly what you want me to learn. And some would say, you've got my attention, but I don't understand what you're saying. There are also those who come, of course, inquiring, ready to ask, quote, the dumb question, and ready to contribute to the learning of others. My point is, are we willing and able to look at what we're like as learners? Are we paying attention to how we ready ourselves to learn, our style, our assumptions, our expectations, our attitudes? Are we aware how much we really influence, if not control, how teachable each of us really is. Now, if the place of learning is not the traditional classroom, but a congregation or an interdenominational community, and the curriculum is not math or English, but the gospel of Jesus Christ, the character of our being, one with another, heretofore, here and hereafter, then what would describe us as learners? Who may instruct us? And what does it mean to be teachable? It's been very difficult for me to try and explain the concept of being teachable. I have, ex I have experienced it in myself and in others with more certainty than I can describe it. Because of our individuality, the expression varies, but the common characteristics seem to be and although I'm listing these separately, to me, it makes up a tangible whole. A sense of one's incompleteness, a gnawing awareness of a desired divine and future state, a contrite spirit, a humble heart, a knowledge of one's worth, a reverence for the worth of others, the trusting readiness often most apparent in small children, 
a belief in one's abilities, one's capacity to grow, and one's capacity to contribute, and an acknowledgement of our interdependency as sons and daughters of our heavenly parents. Perhaps fundamentally, being teachable means we daily open ourselves to the consistency of God's love for us. We accept we are loved and make real in our complex and earthly lives the cornerstone commandments to love him and to love our neighbor as ourselves. We can acknowledge that encoded into each of us, no matter who we are or where we are, are two common things, the common language of learning, which really is love, and a most common bond that we came here to learn, to speak one with another concerning the welfare of our souls, and in fact, to progress eternally. Our capacity to, ta- our capacity to be taught is infinite. Whatever our current circumstances, whatever the condition of our physical abilities, and whatever status we may hold in the eyes of others, we have an infinite capacity to be teachable. It is often easy to move away from such a compelling awareness of our potential. We can both allow and assist others in getting in the way of our being teachable. We can find for a variety of reasons, doubt, fear, convenience, comfort, ways to deny our capacity for learning and to lose faith in ourselves, to lose faith in the love of others around us, and to lose faith in God's love for us. Although we may not say it this way, by not believing in our capacity to learn, even from our mistakes and from the examples of others, by not believing in our capacity to really influence others to do good, we attempt to deny the power of God in us. I know what it's like in serving with present dire to be looked upon as a daughter of God, and that is very, very empowering. I hope I have conveyed to you my belief and our capacity and our responsibility to remain ever the learning children of our Heavenly Father, and that this condition of being teachable is fundamentally linked to God's love for us, ours for Him and for one another. Now I would like to suggest five things that impact on this quality of being teachable, and then lastly to comment on three areas where I strongly feel we could currently edify our discussions as we speak one with another. First, let's demonstrate what we already know so that our preparation to learn even more is evident to both our earthly parents, our Heavenly Father, and those who are in authority over us in the congregation. Why are we so constantly reminded of things? Why are basic principles so frequently repeated? Perhaps we have not demonstrated in our daily behavior our ability to do those things. Long ago, King Benjamin said to his congregation, If you believe all these things, See that you do them. If we're demonstrating what we have learned, even a reminder will be heard without offense. When I was 16, I backed out of our steep driveway, directly into the only parked car on the other side of the street. (laughs) I think over the decades, (laughs) I've proven I can navigate my parents' driveway. And because of that, their reminders are not heard the same way they were heard the first few times after the accident, when I had not proved myself. Sometimes we treat requests such as visiting teaching, home teaching, preparation for meetings, or even to be compassionate as things we could do if we really had the time or if we really wanted to. I have experienced the deception that can come when we confuse thinking about possible actions with the actual effort required to do them. I don't learn as much from thinking about ways I can be charitable as I do from exercising charity in my conduct with others, and from learning from that very real experience. What if, as a Water State congregation, the next time we met, we had paid our tithes, made sure our love for our neighbors and how we treated them, had proven obedient to the commandments, and in diverse ways gave full expression to our faith? What would the speakers talk to us about? By our efforts, wouldn't we have demonstrated a readiness to learn that would call forth even greater instructions. In discussing the glory of the city of Enoch, Neil Maxwell presents a narrative which progressively illustrates the readiness of a people and includes these observations. 
Our unity is not the unity of compulsion or of mindless rapport, but the realization that unity is a necessity. It helps greatly to do first things first, not only because they are important, but because the order of things really does matter. In our meetings, we recount our blessings and we hear the blessings of others. And still quoting from Brother Maxwell, we feel and see the accumulations of affection from God to his people. As Alma said, by small and simple things are great things brought to pass. Then let's demonstrate we can do seemingly small and simple things. Secondly, we can learn about being teachable when we seek to balance being directed and being anxiously engaged. There are absolutes in life, things we are not supposed to do, but there's also an awful lot of ambiguity, several possible ways to do good, to influence others, and multiple opportunities to excel. In the face of ambiguity, some of us will be directed and we will know for certain what we're to do. And for others of us, it'll be up to us to figure out what to do. Sometimes I have personally, sometimes what I have personally supposed to have been learning has been painfully obvious to me and to others around me. Other times I have struggled literally years to try and understand an experience or to try and embrace a principle. Being receptive and being active are both ways to enhance our teachableness. There is probably a little bit of both Julia Child and MacGyver in us. <laughs> Some of us want the recipe. We want the ingredients explicitly identified. We want to see their relationship. We want to know how to do this. On the other hand, some of us, like MacGyver, want the basic principles and will make do with whatever materials are around us. <laughs> now, anyone who doesn't watch MacGyver on ABC, find someone who does and ask him what a MacGyverism really is. <laughs> but these differences in how we approach learning should invite interest in each other, not judgment. If we err in either extreme, either thinking if we're not told we don't have to try, or thinking I resent being told I can figure it out for myself, then we both, in both ways, diminish our ability to be taught. Thirdly, we can seek to increase our capacity to discern. Our lives are complex. Our circumstances varied. Failure to develop our spiritual capacity to discern could leave us overwhelmed, overdependent, overcommitted, and overreacting to the next thing that pops up. We're here to make choices. This was made evident to me quite powerfully in a priesthood blessing which I was told in, es in essence, you will know what is good to do if you do not reason it away. I have thought about that often and thought about the criteria it suggests for discerning what is good to do in my life. I believe we develop discernment by exercising it. We can combine our efforts with the guidance of the Spirit. We can compare our experience with those of others without feeling in competition, and we can rejoice in their excellence and still know there are ways we can excel. And especially, we can monitor our progress and discern the gains we make or the patterns in how we are vulnerable to temptation. I'm indebted to a wise old friend, both old in years and association, of another faith who taught me to take an active interest in learning about the patterns in my life and how temptations occurred. He struggled a long time with some of his and finally decided to take this proactive interest to try and anticipate where in his life he might encounter, quote, that old trickster devil again. He became a good scout. He watched the terrain of his life and he could tell where it looked like his own form of quicksand might be and he rerouted. He gave up going, to, going further to see how close he could get to that quicksand, only to be enmeshed in it and have to struggle back. Fourthly, we are teachable when we can trust in the Lord. Sometimes we won't know in advance. Sometimes in our lives we'll wait on the Lord a long time. But we still need to ready ourselves to be learning even though the specific opportunities to express what we're learning may not be as apparent or as exciting as we had hoped. I gained an appreciation of this point a few weeks ago when I accompanied my sister to St. George. Her three children sing in the Utah Valley Children's Choir, and she wanted to hear their concert. I wanted to sleep and read, and she convinced me I could do that in the car while she drove, so, so I ended up going with her. 
The kids had worked hard at paying attention to Beverly's direction, learning the lyrics, rehearsing the harmony, and trying to show up at performance wearing the appropriate outfit for the number they were going to perform. They really do do a good job. After their last concert, the kids had a chance to stop in Zion's Park on their way home. Diane and I pulled up alongside the bus as it unloaded 60 noisy kids who raced up the path to Weeping Rock. We decided it'd be a lot safer to wait in the parking lot. <laughs> then it got strangely quiet in the canyon. We couldn't see the kids. And next, truly angelic sounds filled the canyon. People in the parking lot who were not with our group stopped. We all heard the words echoing in the canyon. We will sing for the Lord. We will sing for the Lord is listening. He hears the praise of our hearts. We will sing for the Lord is listening. We lift up our voices and start to sing for the Lord. It was truly a beautiful moment of clarity and harmony. When the song ended, there was a joyous shout and then the more familiar chaotic noise of kids racing back to the bus. When they got back, their excitement and their joy was tangible. Did you hear us, they inquired. And they relayed the story of an older couple who'd been up by the rock and when they announced they were going to start singing had slowly backed up. <laughs> not knowing what to anticipate from this uh, large group of kids, but they stood transfixed when the children began singing. Now, when they started the choir, no one promised Diane's children a perfect moment in Zion's Park on April 29th, but there it was. If they had not been ready, both individually prepared and collectively willing to participate, they could not have had that experience. It's one thing to arrive at a place like Zion's Weeping Rock and realize, you know, this would be a great place for a group of kids to spontaneously experience the product of their learning and the love of the Lord. <laughs> it's quite another to experience. Oh, here is the place you have prepared for me. And having been taught, I'm ready. Earlier, when describing the qualities which contribute to being teachable, I listed self-worth. How we understand self-worth greatly impacts the degree to which we are teachable. So my fifth point is there's a difference between self-worth and self-importance. God loves us and we are valued to him. But if I'm teachable, I can learn from others who acknowledge their worth without becoming vain, who assess their strengths without becoming boastful, and who, when surrounded by the blessings of a loving Heavenly Father, can remember Alma's caution to his son, do not say, O oh God, I thank thee we are better than our brethren, but say rather, O oh Lord, forgive my unworthiness and remember my brethren in mercy. If we do not care much for ourselves, then to love our neighbors ourselves doesn't mean very much. Loving ourselves can magnify our charity toward others. If we overvalue or undervalue ourselves, we are less able and less ready to learn. We either think we can't learn much from that person or we don't trust why they're interacting with us. And perhaps a harder part, learning how to enable someone else to love themselves is a lot harder than my just telling them that I love them. We each have a gift, and we can learn how to remind each other of ways, how to remind each other of the value of our part that we contribute to the whole of our congregations. Now, having sought to be teachable, to embrace the qualities and to comprehend the challenges, I want to suggest three aspects of our interaction where being teachable currently seems a very needed goal. One, that we might better know the experience of being a woman or being a man in our congregation. What is it like for someone who is different from us? If we are a woman, what can we know of the experience of men as fathers, husbands, siblings, and brothers in the gospel? If we are men, what can we know of the experience of women? If we too quickly assume we know what the experience of someone else is, or should be if they're worthy in our opinion, then we're less prepared to learn from speaking together concerning the welfare of our souls. I can imagine that Maxwell's description of the quality of the conversation in the city of Enoch is instructive to each of us as men and women. Quote, you should observe how they listen to each other instead of seeking to display their own learning. They are more willing to be impressed than to try to impress. I think that description is important, no matter if we're eager to impress either our, quote, conservative values or, quote, our liberal values. We have much to learn from one another in living the gospel 
and we can best do that by staying in relationship to each other. I know in my own life it is easier to talk about somebody than to talk with them, but I know my learning is different when I stay in relationship to them. I have learned to listen without feeling that others will think my listening means agreement, and I have learned that being too anxious to tell others where our differences exist hasn't helped me understand them. I welcome the opportunity to share the similarities and differences of our experience as women in the church and sisters in the gospel. I'm interested in how men support our sisterhood and how they understand and support our learning. I want to know how they experience our supporting their friendships as men and sustaining their priesthood, which they hold. A second area where being teachable can strengthen our interaction has to do with the quality of our service to one another in the congregation and our communities. Having heard myself, where much is given, much is expected, I have sometimes allowed my own, my own need to be serving to determine what I did rather than paying close attention to the needs of others. Seeking to meet the needs of others is more of a challenge than doing what's convenient for me to do to be helpful. Paying attention to how others are is a powerful factor. Tim Galway wrote about the necessity of paying attention to service. Interestingly enough, he was talking about tennis. <laughs> and he was suggesting that to improve our service, we had to learn to love the tennis ball. And I remember when I read that saying, what? I have to learn to love a tennis ball? <laughs> but he meant, pay attention to it. See how it bounces. See where the seams are when it comes at you. Concentrate. When we love, we concentrate our attention. By truly paying attention to others around me and concentrating on them, I can place myself in their service and I am taught what is needed. I saw a very pragmatic example of this a few semesters ago when a member of a study group who had obviously better computer skills than the others didn't take the attitude, I learned it, so can they. And he didn't say, I'll do it, you'll never learn this anyway. <laughs> Instead, he watched, he made himself available, he answered questions, he encouraged. He didn't exaggerate, but present in his daily interaction with his study group, he was taught how he could teach them, and then he did. Now lastly, the best expression of our willingness to be teachable is to be ever ready to say at any moment in our lives, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. Maxwell states further, the Lord loves both the teachable and the unteachable, but it is through the obedience of the teachable that God can help these helpers and that all might be benefited thereby. For each of us, and for myself, I pray that we will realize that my obedience, my agency, my acknowledgement of God's love for me, my love for him, for each of us as neighbors and myself, my personal testimony of the truthfulness of his gospel, and my willingness to trust his further instruction are never more evident than when I can echo in a small way in my own life the words of our elder brother, here am I, send me. I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.